Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to the second episode of our In Conversation series as part of our Zoom for Thought series, uh, inviting luminaries from the world of music uh, to reflect on how things are going, how we've all responded to the issues of the recent year, uh, and generally to reflect on, on, on the situation in the arts at the moment and how we're all managing to respond. And I'm very pleased to say that my guest this evening is Kate Romano. Kate is a clarinetist, a producer, a presenter on Radio 3, a writer, thinker, general animateur, uh, and is currently CEO of the Stapleford Granary, uh, an arts venue in Cambridge. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, that she's taken some time in order to be able to talk to us this evening. So please welcome into the studio a big silent virtual welcome anyway for my guest this evening, Kate Romano. Kate, welcome. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. We were saying just before we came on air um, that uh, actually we're, we're all going through all manner of uh, continuing professional development in terms of the technical skills that we're all, all having to develop uh, almost a year on since everything started and the, the the amount of technological expertise that we have or haven't managed to develop uh, rather than being practicing musicians as, as that's been the same for you. Oh, it's astonishing, isn't it? I mean, you know, who, who knew that, as you say, practicing musicians that we would end up having to deal with all these layers of tech um i mean it, it felt tough enough a, a year ago when we were all going what's zoom but uh, it, you know here we are again sharing multiple platforms and and for me and you know so, some of my roles i'm trying to understand ticketing systems that are linked up to e-news it's linked up to something else and something else and it just yeah it, it's quite overwhelming sometimes i have to say <laughs> I am a little bit teched out. So, so far, this has gone flawlessly. And I was really enjoying the, the countdown library music there. It gets the adrenaline going. <laughs> going well so far. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, as you say, we've all we've all been having to find new ways to to engage audiences and keep connected with with, with everyone at a time when we're being forced to find new creative possibilities. And, and, and you you took over as CEO of Stapleford Granary sometime last year when amidst all of this. Is that right? Yeah, it was August. It was a really, really sunny, hot period in August. I remember we sat in the beautiful orchard at the granary discussing this. And I don't think any of us thought we'd still be in this position um, at this time. I thought I think we thought it would be over by now, to be honest. Um, it's been a strange time to join an organisation. I, You know, wonderful in many ways, but strange as well. Never quite knowing it in normal times. I mean, I knew it as a venue before, but not in a position of leadership. Um, it's not all been bad. I think there's something about coming into a venue not in normal times that perhaps enables you to see it in a slightly different way. You know, you see the spaces differently. If they're not full of people, you see it through slightly fresh eyes and think, oh, I wonder if we could do something with that. Or I wonder if we could use that space slightly differently. So um, I, can, I can find positives, but I'd rather it wasn't this way. I'd rather it was full of people and concerts. <laughs> 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 because it, it's it's following what 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 you've been doing um since last august you've you've very much been uh looking to to share share the venue as a as a creative space for people to come and and do recordings and 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 find digital ways to keep their music making going has that has that has that been something that that you've you've enjoyed the challenge of for all that we're going oh, i wish it would be back to normal with live audiences actually presenting the venue as a place where you can do socially distanced recordings and so on yeah, I mean, I, I think there's something intuitive about musicians, about wanting to share. I think that's fundamental to us, to, to want to keep working with other people. You know, that doesn't go away just because we're not allowed to be making music together. The, the feeling of wanting to make music doesn't go away. And there's also something quite special about the granary. I mean, I probably sound biased. I am. But it is an incredibly beautiful space. I know that when people come there, when artists come here, that people fall in love with it, which, you know, I've done. I promised myself I wouldn't, but I have done. I've fallen in love with the building. Um, and it, you, you want to share it with people. That's absolutely intuitive and fundamental. And one of the first things that I did when I started there in August, September was black out the concert hall, which was it's quite a big job, actually. There's about, I think there's 
10 windows in there, 10 large windows and a door and some big kind of high up windows, circular windows. So we got all that blacked out really quickly and got some lights for filming so that we could do digital work. At that point, there wasn't really a strategy or a plan. It was almost more an intuitive feeling of, let's get set up for this so that we can do it properly. And I'm so glad that we did that because it has been a way of still working with artists, keeping a light on for artists, saying, yes, we can do this safely. I mean, our venue is very large, very open plan, fantastic air extraction system because it's new. It's a new renovation. So mm -hmm. we're quite lucky in that respect that if there's no one on site, you know, if there's just one person on site, you can still we can still make things happen in a very COVID safe environment. So whilst we're close to the public for things like concerts, we've still been able to continue with streaming and um, projects for people like recording albums and film projects. And of course, because we're creative people, we couldn't help but start making our own creative work in space as well, which if I'm honest, has been a little bubble of joy in all this. It, mm -hmm. I mean, it's Something that I've really enjoyed doing and I think the artists who have come in have come in with new ideas and we we just we were reflecting on it the other day and thinking gosh we've learned so much and the only way to do it is to learn is to do it. Mm. That's you know, right and I think and do you are there any because obviously we're used to doing things in a sort of in an analog fashion you know with other people performing rehearsing the electricity and in, in the, 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 that connection between performer and audience in 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 the performing experience and we're looking to try and find ways to to either replace that or recreate that in in the digital way are there any are there any digital avenues that you've pursued where you thought actually yes that that's worked quite well and, and we might develop that after all this is over as, as as a sort of positive digital stream if you like yeah we've i think we've tackled different things in different ways so when we've had artists in who are making say recordings for like an online festival um we've very much we've, we've given them an audience even if it was only me sitting in there because it's just <laughs> want to play to and that is nicer still than playing to nobody I think because it's it's a funny hybrid isn't it a sort of a, you know a recording for an online festival or something it's not like a studio recording for an album but it's also not a live stream because you know it's going to mm. be there for quite a long time so it's a slightly difficult hybrid uh, so even if it's just to get the adrenaline going for a little bit it's nice if there's someone in the room to do that I think uh, the biggest thing for us has been learning how, well, learning how to film, learning how to, you know, get the nice lighting sets and all that sort of thing, all the very practical stuff. But we've been very interested in creating some work for our own YouTube channel, which is a new initiative, uh, which is things that are not just concerts, you know, so it's not rather than, oh, here's a concert, wish you were here, but you couldn't be, so we filmed it. But mm -hmm. actually, filming things in very different ways so that it's a piece of digital media in its own right. Now, that, that's a, it's easy to say that phrase, let's make digital media in its own right, but it is very hard to do. And I think, you know, we're trying to, you know, we, we're trying to rethink a 400 year old tradition here and that doesn't happen overnight. And it's, a, it's completely understandable, I think, that most of our digital efforts are, well, here's a recording of a concert that, that would have happened. But sometimes we've been making some things and thinking, actually, that, that does really work well as a piece of digital media, better than a concert. And it just takes time, I think, to get in that mindset. If you just say to artists, think digitally, you can't do that overnight. It's, it's going to take time. But it's it's been good. Um, we only actually opened this YouTube channel two weeks ago, and you know, you say to me, "Why did you do that? Does the world need another YouTube channel?" No, probably not. But actually, the benefits of it have been very unexpected and very positive. I, we did it mainly to keep in touch with our local loyal audiences. We wanted to say, you know, well, we can't open to you. If we're thinking about you and we're going to bring you something unique, exclusive, bespoke every two weeks that was filmed at the Granary, something for you. And that's mm -hmm. just been lovely. The, um, the comments that we've had and the feedback and the emails and just, just seeing the subscriber numbers go up instantly and the, the views on the films, it's, that's been really rewarding, actually, just to know that there is an audience out there. We are still in touch. That's been lovely. 
Uh, and we also wanted it to be a platform for artists, uh, friends of the granary, people who perform here a lot. We can say, come in and do something, but also a way of introducing new voices to our audiences. So hopefully in the future, when we give, we can do live concerts again, we can say, oh, do you remember so-and-so from the YouTube channel? Here they are, or here's their music. So it's, it's, it's fulfilling actually quite a lot of objectives very nicely, and we're enjoying it. So <laughs> Good. Because I think that's that's one of the fears that that, that venues have. Uh, I've been noticing venues have is that if they aren't able to continue engaging with local audiences and 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 you know keeping keeping their community, their local community close to them, and saying you know even though we can't do things normally, we we are still here. We are still you know we we value our local community, our loyal community of supporters. There's a sense that they, venues might feel that they they become invisible and disappear. So it's as much about reminding people that, that that you're still there and still operating even though the doors are shut and and you can't welcome them back into the venue it's still saying to your loyal audience we are still here and, and we will be back absolutely and a bit of course it's not reaching all of our audiences not everybody engages online but um you know but but at least we know there is a good number who do and uh and we've also been looking at other ways to use the venue so you know covid or not it, it's I think COVID has been a catalyst for thinking about things more quickly that we perhaps would have done at some point, but it's, it's sped it all up. So for example, we're going to be doing outdoor concerts in the summer. So we've re been rethinking the courtyard and the way it works and how we can cover it up and all that sort of thing so that we can do outdoor concerts. Now, if we're still socially distanced, that's going to be a good thing. But actually, even if we're not, outdoor concerts are fantastic. It means we can bring different artists to the granary, different audiences. We can open it up for all sorts of different events. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not just the digital thing. I think it's been a catalyst for thinking about audiences and ways we can bring things to people in, in many different ways, actually. Because obviously, as, as you said before, you know, it's the, the traditional model of concert giving, the 7.30 in the evening, two hour concert with an interval for drinks and so on. That's probably on its way out now as people look at slimmer, shorter concerts mm -hmm. with no interval, you know, 45 minutes, rush hour concerts, tea times concerts. Do you feel that that's a good thing? The fact that we're revisiting the sort of the concert tradition and, 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 and streamlining it and making it slightly shorter and at different times so that it's accessible to, to different types of audiences? Yeah, I mean, I, I love a short concert. I, I really, I've always loved a short concert. I, I like lots of short concerts. Um, I think as when the, as a producer um, before I was at the Granary, I think all the shows I made were never more than 60 minutes. And there's something incredibly flexible about a 60 minute show. You know, it could be a lunchtime thing. It could be, a, as you say, a rush hour concert. It's in the evening with something else. You can bolt things onto it. Hey, okay, hell, it could be a breakfast concert. You know, what? why not? Um, and I really like that. Uh, we've been modelling when we could open to audiences between the lockdowns. We instantly went on to the two shorter concerts in one evening because, you know, we we have to make the maths work somehow. And the only way that we can get close to our capacity audience is to do it twice. In a way, we're quite lucky because our concert hall is small. So although we were taking a knock in audience numbers, it's not as catastrophic as if you had a you know a venue that seats five thousand, and it's it's the, the numbers are much smaller. I mean, capacity for us is one hundred and twenty people. Mm -hmm. So if we can fit thirty five in there, and then we do it twice, we've got seventy, which is not a million miles away. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's it's getting closer. So we went straight into the two concerts in one day model with enough time, of course, to deep clean between the concerts and get everyone out. No intervals, no paper programmes. And it's it's been good. It was really good. Audiences liked it. I love the no paper programmes. I don't want to put any programme writers out of a job, but it, we all talk more. Everybody talks more. And I love that. I mean, I like talking anyway, as you probably know. But... Um, <laughs> I think that's a real bonus. I think that that's been a, a real positive. I, I'd be amazed if we go back to paper programmes after this. I think that, and I've been presenting the uh, the Wigmore concerts as well, and a lot of audience members have commented. Even when you know, sometimes the call hall's empty, and sometimes we've had an audience, but they've all said how much nicer it is to have somebody introducing 
the uh, the pieces and the you know because you can't read the programs anyway in the dark so it's just <laughs> a souvenir really doesn't it <laughs> that's true and i think it also it's about about uh, 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 the connection we talk about the connection don't we between performer and audience uh, uh, as mm -hmm. part of the kind of the, the the live music experience and that bringing that connection further still with with, with actually uh, performers introducing themselves and introducing what they're doing and talking to the audience rather than the traditional way of you know audience enters in one door performers come on stage performers do their thing audience support and then they go their separate ways this is 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 is, is probably a, a better way of forging that connection and just bringing the audience and performers slightly closer together even though classical musicians don't necessarily like sort of introducing and speaking from the stage is that something that you've noticed that that, that performers don't necessarily like doing that always well it's funny you say that isn't it we always assumed that but actually i don't think i've come across a single performer recently who said oh i can't do that they've all been really good at it I think we were all really good at it all along. We just didn't do it. Nobody asked us to. <laughs> so you don't know until you find out, do you? And actually, everyone's been great. And nobody's even hesitated when we've said, are you okay to introduce your own program? I mean, the backup is I would do it, but they don't want to. They thought it's been, been brilliant, that, that side of it. And you, you mentioned earlier the fact that that when you're when people are in filming in 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 Stapleford Granary, simply your sitting there as the sole audience member has made a a difference to the to the to the performance and so on. Is that because? I mean, presumably it's because it's different performing to an empty venue, even to just one single pair of ears, the sense that, that actually somebody is listening live at that time rather than being recorded for future ears, if you like. Just the experience for the performers was was much improved simply by your being the sole listener. So they say, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, I did it because um, because they said they'd like that and they wanted it. Well, I did it because I wanted to listen as well, obviously. But, but, <laughs> but they, they've all said it. It just changes it. I think it does. You're a performer as well. I'm a performer. I think we know that the minute somebody's listening, something changes. Um, so that that's yeah. I, and it's at times it's felt like the most extraordinary privilege. I have to say to be there, to be that audience member. Think, gosh, you know, everyone else gets this online. I'm getting this for real. That's that's quite incredible. You know, to be to be in the Wigmore Hall and to have. Alina Ibragimova playing the Cesar Front Sonata to you is, you know, I remember that for my life. That it, It's deeply moving, actually. Something incredibly special about that. And I, I do feel so privileged to have heard a lot of performances of, of you know, that calibre, which I wouldn't have done probably had it not been for this. That's, that's just a personal, I've been really lucky. Um, other fantastic artists we've had coming to the Granary, a lot of the YCAT artists as well, very similar, just me and, um, and the cameraman. Um, yeah, very special, actually. And your your digital channel, which you've just launched, began with, with the not um, inconsiderable piano presence of Joanna McGregor. Yes, Joanna is a friend of the Granary. She's uh, played here a few times, and uh, she was the first concert we opened up with between the lockdowns. Uh, and like all venues, we had lots of artists booked and we've had to postpone and move things and juggle things around uh so after a lot of moving stuff around uh we came up with a very small program between the lockdowns but but the first concert just as it happened was joanna who came along and uh, played a, a 60 minute program and uh, as part of that she very kindly gave us a sort of six minute exclusive um, performance which we could film before the audience came in so so we launched our a YouTube channel with that, which which was lovely. But it's going to be very eclectic, quite quirky, all sorts of different things on it. It's not just performances. Uh, you know, at the Granary, we we do, we're not, it's not just classical music. Uh, there's a strong tradition of programming jazz and folk music as well. But we've been creating our own sort of behind the scenes films about artists and interesting people. And um, so we've got, we've got all sorts of different things coming up. It's going to be really interesting to see what people like I think we'll learn a lot about our audiences this way. That's one of the objectives. 
and the, and and in fact, the, the the reach for audiences, some places are finding that they're actually reaching a far wider audience through presenting things online. You know, international audiences and and audiences from far flung corners of the country that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to, who wouldn't necessarily have come to the gig. Hopefully, yeah. there's a sense that, that actually the digital reach is is allowing people to 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 access concerts. You know, if they've got childcare issues or or, or or they're infirm or elderly and they can't actually get to the venue, the venue can come to them in some ways. You actually reach a different type of audience to the ones who would normally come through your door. You do. It, it's, it's, I'm a real geek about kind of data analysis of things like this. I love watching patterns of behaviour, which you can't get so much from a concert because everyone just sits there. You don't know when they've zoned out in their head. But, <laughs> but on YouTube analytics, you do. You know they've zoned out after two minutes into a six-minute tango. <laughs> so it, it's quite an eye-opener, actually, isn't it? I mean, we've all learned so much about our audiences this way. You know, we went into the pandemic thinking, OK, this is fine. We'll just put all our concerts online and people will buy tickets because that's what they do normally. Only they didn't. They didn't mm. buy tickets. And we all went, oh, that's interesting. So it wasn't actually just the music that they wanted to see. And actually, we've put so much out there for free anyway. We don't. It's very hard to get any sort of evaluation or data out of this. It's true the numbers are very big. I mean, if you look at some of the viewing figures for the Wigmore Hall concerts, you know, they're in the, the tens of thousands. They're massive. I don't think people are watching things necessarily in the same way or all the way through, but certainly the reach is potentially huge. And interestingly, it doesn't just apply to concerts. I mean, I know um, seriously entrepreneurial teachers who have um, are teaching around the world now which they wouldn't have done before. You know, they've they found new, new students literally all around the world. So I think it's it's changed things in, in good ways um, for that. But the, the problem remains with concerts, of course, monetizing it, online content. But the reach is good. Absolutely. And what about you? You know, that, that that's you with your, your venue manager and CEO hat on. But 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 as a freelance musician and as, as a clarinetist as well, how have you found... Uh, uh, keeping keeping your your own musicianship going through through the past year. Hmm. Uh, a bit of a mixture, really. I've been playing with my daughter quite a bit, actually. You know, lucky to be locked down with a, a good a good young violinist. So <laughs> in the early days, we worked our way through a lot of bar top violin duets, which <coughs> did wonders for my transposition. Um, <laughs> and uh, but do you know, I think the main thing is I've just really enjoyed playing my clarinet. I wasn't not so much early on, but certainly over the last few months, as as you know, as we've started to have deadlines again, and we've potentially got quite a couple of you know, there's maybe an album in the in the pipeline and things like that. So we've got got deadlines that might actually happen, which is always a good a good you know, yeah, the adrenaline starts flowing again. You think crumbs are really. <laughs> um, but one of the really joyful things I think about picking up a clarinet at the end of the day is it's just this. The simplicity of it in a way that when it's analog you know if it if it's broken if it sounds rubbish i can fix it i know what to do to fix it and i love that i just need to practice it more or in a different way <laughs> it's, it's when you've had an absolute day of tech hell for whatever reason to so just pick up a musical instrument just feels utterly joyful it's really nice I, that's true i think it's you know we spend so much of the day battling to find new ways of doing things or, or, or new digital ways of engagement and capturing what we do and and trying to rethink traditional ways of doing things to, to, to make them more engaging or or more possible that actually just sitting down with the instrument that that, that you've played for for years and, and actually doing things and 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 solve as you say solving issues and 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 the simplicity of, of of playing again and and being able to resolve things there and then rather than thinking right I could I could do this, but I'm not sure how it's going to work digitally, and and all those complications. They it's they evaporate when it's just you and the instrument, don't they? Uh, it's nice. It's like it's like touching base. It's like grounding yourself again. It's 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 reminding yourself actually who you are. I think which is really important. I mean, you know, like yourself, Dan. I do, I do many many things, but I think you know fundamentally you're, you're still a musician. That doesn't leave you still a performer at heart, even if you're not doing it all the time. And it's it's just very good to remind yourself of that and I think 
now where the the few moments we have had when we've been able to play together a little bit you know a few duos or work, working with members of my ensemble when we have got together oh, it's it's just wonderful it just lifts you so much and that's the same message that i've been getting from the the artists at the wigmore and the artists who have come to the granary to record there's a there's a sort of renewal of love i think for what we do you know because we lost it and then when you get the chance to do it and perhaps we're not quite prepared for things in the same way you know we we can't have hours and hours and hours of rehearsal now you you there are perhaps things being done a little more spontaneously which is lovely because god you know hardly any of our life can be spontaneous at the moment but if we still find that spontaneity in music performance especially if it's just a little bit under rehearsed you know when you're going and you're just a bit on the edge with it and you're not actually worrying about what's on the next page because you can't remember what's going to be there but, <laughs> but because these are such phenomenal musicians of course that you know that they're, they're just playing their hearts out and I think there is a different kind of energy about performance at the moment when you hear it. I don't quite know what it is. Maybe we'll look back and be able to work out what that was. But there's something in the air, I think, that, that's incredibly exciting when, when musicians can play together at the moment. I want to kind of, I want to bottle it and keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's, it's, I mean, and, and again, that's the same with with recording things, isn't it? For for um, digital consumption that goes online forever afterwards, and there, there's that there's real anxiety. And certainly, I felt when I'm recording something that this, this will stay this way, and I will forever be accountable for it for people after you know if, if I make a slip or an error or I don't do it properly, I will forever look back on it and regret it, and presumably so will the people who are watching it. So it's there's more pressure when you're recording something, whereas I think there's much, there's a greater liberation for risk-taking, I think, in, in the live performing arena, because you know that it's all about that particular moment, and if it's not recorded, it will go, and you you won't necessarily have to be accountable for it afterwards. It's 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 that, that, that ability to take risks that somehow recording takes away from you because you know it will be a permanent record. Yeah, and I think this is what, when I said earlier, you know, these these things we're doing are hybrids, and this is why it's so difficult, because it's, you know, if you're at the Wigmore, it's live, it's a live concert, but it's also going to be there for a month. So it's, it, you know, they're, they're, so yes, you take all the risks that you would take in a live performance, but you also know if, if they don't all quite pay off, it's still going to be there to listen back to, which of course it never is in a live performance. So I think it's it's very difficult for performers, but my God, you know, they're all rising to it and just doing it. Quite incredible. Be interesting to know if this stays with us, this this sort of switch, this ability to, to do this that we've suddenly had to do. It's asking a lot of performers, I think. You know, mm. I, I, I had to have a bit of a word with myself early on when I thought, oh, we've got people coming to the granary. This is great. You know, we can do um, a concert. Let's ask them to do the concert twice. Oh, and let's see if we can record a bit as well. And I thought, whoa, hang on a minute. This this is a massive ask of a performer. You're saying, can you perform for the cameras? And can you perform your programme and introduce it? And then can you have a little rest and we'll feed you? And can you do it again? And I thought, oh, slow down a bit, Kate. You know, and I, <laughs> some people want to do that, but not everybody does. And God, I don't blame them. We're asking a lot of performers. And it's interesting that um, have most of the performers of, of whom you've asked for them to do do the the short concert twice been receptive to that idea? Because sometimes that can be a real luxury, isn't it? You have a go and you perform it, and then the opportunity to perform that program again might not necessarily come mm -hmm. round for several months or several years if you're not touring it, or, or uh, the, the opportunity to do if if it's a new piece or something, you know, the difficult second performance opportunity, the actual ability to do a concert and then have a break and then do it again is is that something that performers have in general been receptive to yeah it's and it's a good question isn't it because often you know when i've done a concert i come off stage and the first thing i think is of, oh i want to do that again and, and you've got the opportunity to do it again of course if it doesn't go really well you might not think i want to do it again <laughs> <laughs> but generally generally things do go okay um so yes uh, broadly i would say everybody has been absolutely up for it they understand the situation they know that we're all just trying to make this work and this is a way to do it it's a it's a shorter concert can you do it twice but you know you you know how much musicians put into a performance and sometimes you know and i see someone come off stage and i think God, they've literally given everything 
and now they've got to find that and do it again. That's it is tough. It's a different way of pacing yourself. You can argue and say, well, you know, opera singers can sing for three hours in one evening. It's not such a big deal. But it's it's a pacing thing, isn't it? It's a, probably like there's probably some sporting analogy about sprints and marathons or, or something about still being able to deliver and do things very well. But just knowing that you have to hold something back, but then also not feeling like the first concert lacks something. It's it's a it's psych a psychology, isn't it? That I think we're we're just having to adapt to and get used to. But but broadly, I would say you know musicians have been fantastic and they're kind of whatever works. Interestingly, one or two said, can, "Can we make some changes to the second program?" You know, you think you're you think it's a nicer offer to someone to say, "Can you just do the same thing twice?" But a few have said, "Actually, it's it's kind of better if we do something a bit different in the second one. Maybe just a small tweak, but." Just just keeps the adrenaline flowing, so you don't feel like you know that that feeling like when you're driving along, you think, have I, have I been around that roundabout before? Have I? <laughs> when you have two lectures back to back, you can't remember if you've told the same joke in the first one or the second one. <laughs> 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 so I think that yeah, yeah. So we're, you know, we're all learning how to do this. And well, I guess that's that's the thing about musicians is that we're, we're 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 instinctively and naturally collaborative people aren't we you know we're, we 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 thrive on on working with in in rehearsal and performance with others and so there is generally a collective will to 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 make things work i think that that, that over the past year that the, the the most fruitful uh discussions i've had with people and dialogues and, and so on have been with people who are of the of the mind of right let's find a way to wait a way to make this work rather than or well, we can't do it in the way that we normally would so let's let's just put things on pause it's about yes how can we make this work in the new era is that something that you found too Yes, I think everybody is, is is trying their absolute hardest to to you know still make things work it's interesting isn't it that there hasn't been a huge shift. I think most of the things we've done are still quite close to what we wanted it to be like. There's not, there's been nothing that is absolutely flipped it on its head. And there's a part of me that wonders if we've slightly missed a trick there. It's a bit controversial, isn't it? You know, this, <laughs> I'm just thinking if I if I can step outside my role for a minute, if I can step outside the arts and you know the utter devastation and everything that it makes me feel uh, the, the upset and the heartbreak and if I could just step outside it and think you know this this was never this was never planned this was never going to be part of any of our lives we never saw this coming it's it's like what what could have paused the arts I mean there were experiments in the past where people tried to do that there was an art strike there was things like that where people tried to work out what the effects would be of stopping the arts I mean when you step outside it, you think that that's incredible. Nothing else could have done this. So what is the impact of that? And actually, if it's sort of nothing, I think we've missed a trick somewhere because we are such creative thinkers. And I don't want this to be a just, I don't want this to be a chapter in a book where the next one you read and says, oh, and everything just went back to normal. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have missed something. We'll have missed a chance to rethink what we do because it, it wasn't perfect, far from it. And if we're no. not, if it, if it's just gonna kind of go, let's completely go back to normal, then we've, we've missed an opportunity to address things that weren't working. We've missed an opportunity to hear voices that we've heard during the pandemic that we wouldn't have done. We've missed an opportunity to stop this sort of hier the hierarchies that are very inherent in a lot of classical music. We've missed an opportunity to look at the different ways we've engaged audiences, and we, we surely have to take some of that forwards because otherwise we've missed a trick, I think. And you're right; it's about uh, looking looking to the future and 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 not relinquishing those new things that we found as a result of the COVID era. Interestingly, one thing I read uh, very recently on Twitter was that businesses and so on um, need to understand that the way everyone is working now remotely, you know, the, the, the flourish in remote working and, and the, the, the business models that are being rethought from the ground up in light of everything that's happened and the changes that are being made. They still need to understand that that remote operating now is remote operating under COVID conditions and isn't the same as remote operating under, you know, in, in, in the normal scheme of things. And, and 
that, that's perhaps true of of the arts and the creative sector too. In that the way that we are working now is is uh, is uh, remote, digital, creative under COVID. And actually, if we're able to work remotely and digitally and creatively outside of COVID, there will still be new avenues to explore. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I hope so. I mean, we yeah, we. I spent so much time trying to crystal ball gaze and wondering what it will be like. And you just can't. You tie yourself in knots with it, don't you? But but I hope so. I think we we are learning things and picking up things, behaviours, attitudes that we're not quite sure how they're going to be realised in the future, but they're there. They won't go away. It won't just leave us. We won't forget this. And and coming into to staple for granary uh you know as as uh, stepping newly into the role how did you find uh coming into a venue that was trying to sort of operate under you know new restrictions and and, and find different ways of working things how did you find that because obviously coming in, in into a venue from outside at a time when it's you know we're all finding new ways to do things anyway and and finding new ways because um one of the things i admire about your work is that you're very you're a, a, a terrifically creative animateur and, and the projects I'm, that I'm thinking of, things like Takeda Road and um, the Hansel and Gretel that are sort of mixed media performances and, and, and you know, they're always about doing uh, things in a very engaging and a different way. How did you find stepping into your role as CEO at, at Stapleford Granary in light of everything that was going on and, and, and in terms of uh, receptivity to the ideas and, and just the ability to plan it all? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think uh, there were lots of firsts because I've never run a venue before. So that that's the first big change. But um, and I think, it, you know, in one sense, it's, it is a bit of a dream come true. I think, you know, for, as you said, for years, I've produced um, shows, lots of music and spoken word and opera and sort of quirky concerts and all, all sorts of things that never had a home. They toured around. And I always said, oh, I love that. I love the kind of pop-up nature of it. I think that's really important. I love the, the flexibility. I like this being homeless. But perhaps there was, you know, somewhere in my mind that thought actually a home for all this might be a nice thing as well. And then when, you know, the granary came along, it it felt, it did feel like a bit of a dream come true. It's a, a venue that I loved for 10 years. So, it, you know, it, it wasn't, it's not difficult to fall in love with that place and think, gosh, all the things that I do and I'm passionate about, I, I can do more of here. You know, we, we can grow things from here. So the decision wasn't a difficult one, but it, you know, to come into a venue in the middle of a pandemic, it is somewhere between a, a dream job and a total nightmare, really, with, with all the different sets of challenges. I think that, as I said earlier, not knowing how it, not, not being there in normal times probably does make you think differently about a place and a space. And I think it's been very useful that I've always operated without a venue. And I think all those, all those skills that I have, all those ways of thinking are, are just sort of coming into a venue. But it's, it's almost like I can because I'm not used to thinking in terms of having a venue, I can still sort of think quite outside the box and think, well, we can still create things that go elsewhere. We can still create things that end up on radio or end up online or, you know, who needs a venue? Well, we've got a venue. <laughs> but it doesn't stop your creative thinking. That's uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is I think if you've only ever created work for a venue, you're probably uh, maybe a little bit more boxed in in your thinking. But if your venue has only ever been in your head, then that doesn't go away. Um, we, our, our situation is quite interesting because we are a, a cultural travel company as well as an arts centre, all part of you know one organisation. We have this subsidiary company, which is a travel company, Ace Cultural Tours, who make uh, uh, incredible um, cultural events, which, again, is, is not a million miles away from producing. They're still wonderful audience experiences. They just tend to last a few days rather than an evening so it's it's not been difficult to get my head into that way of thinking and I think to to bring perhaps a slightly different perspective to the table saying well you know if we were making a production we do this 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 so can we twist that a little bit and bring it over into a different industry you know a travel industry which I know nothing about or didn't but actually sometimes a bit of naivety 
can be quite a useful thing, as I've found many times in my life, when you don't quite know what you're getting into and you just <laughs> go for it and work it out as you go along. But sometimes it, it's sort of that curiosity and that naivety that actually makes you come up with something that might work. If you sort of know it too well, you're, you're, you're perhaps sometimes less likely to come up with something that's a bit radical. So, so we've had some really good conversations there. I guess that's it, isn't it? It's it's uh, if you're used to to working in a, in a according to a traditional model or, or along p- particular guidelines, the ability to sort of think outside that is 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 yeah. not necessarily something that one can do as readily. Whereas, as as you say, as, as you've come from this kind of nomadic arts existence yeah. almost, uh, and and that's actually about sort of keeping that sort of quest for. For, for the audience experience and, and, and not just limiting it to a two hour concert on a Friday night or something. Yeah, and I, and I don't mean to sound arrogant by sort of saying, I'm you know, thinking outside the box, I've got all these ideas. Gosh, I wish I did have all the answers. I, th- I think it just comes from not being trained as a producer or not being trained up in an opera house or not being, tra- you, you know, just sort of working it out as you go along. I think it just gives you a different perspective on things just naturally you almost can't help but look at it sideways on because you don't you don't really know other, any other way um all all my productions everything i've done has always been new i don't think i've ever repeated anything so everything's been a massive learning curve so you're sort of constantly out of your comfort zone but also constantly in it because that's what it is it's always always something new so to just i'm you know i'm in another new situation and i'm learning so much so I almost feel feel guilty for loving that side of it, loving the personal learning curve and the challenges and the what can we do. But at the same time, yeah, like everyone, heartbroken and worried, sick. You know, I'm not going to lie. It's it's uh, the longer this goes on, the worse things become. But there's a sort of there's a personal huge satisfaction in it as well in in learning so much and having to think very hard and very differently all the time, which I love. Absolutely, absolutely, and that sounds like a a, a, a nice positive uh, note on which to end our conversation this evening. Uh, thank you, Kate, for coming along and sharing some of your your insights uh, and your some of the challenges and some of the highs and lows of of working at Stapleford and so on. It's been it's been lovely to welcome you into the studio this evening, and thank you for being a nice, generous guest. Thanks, Dan. It's great to chat to you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And thank you to the viewers at home. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, Join us again next time when we'll be back in the virtual studio uh, with my next guest. So from me, Dan Harding, and from the music department here at the University of Kent, thank you for watching.